Hello, this is Opera Unbound, a podcast that breaks the barriers between opera singers and the audience. We will cover the process, challenges, stereotypes, and inspirations associated with opera. I'm Rachel Moss, the host, and this is my co-host, Mike Heitman. You can learn more about our podcast at www.patreon.com slash Opera Unbound. Today, I'm flying solo as it is a special episode. I'm climbing on my soapbox to dissolve the myths and misconceptions associated with my voice type, the contralto. I'll cover defining the voice type and the origins of voice types, the history of female contraltos in opera, myths and misconceptions, contralto roles in opera, noteworthy contraltos past and present, and reclaiming the voice type. <laughs> So first, we're going to define the contralto voice and what makes it different from the other two female voice types, the soprano and the mezzo-soprano. Now, when we think of contraltos, oftentimes people think of a deep, dark voice, and that's not really how one should define a voice type. What really distinguishes voice types from each other are two major factors. We want to look at where the registration or passaggio of a voice is and what is the tessitura. And the reason why these two things are the most important factors of determining a voice type has to do with one, the vocal science. That's what has really led to a better understanding of how the passaggio in particular plays into the health of the voice. And then the tessitura, because singing in an appropriate tessitura is really essential to the vocal health and longevity of a singer. Now, getting into the nitty gritty of the contralto voice type. So the thing that's really special about the contralto voice is the intensity of power in the middle and chest register. So when we're looking at voice types, this is soprano, mezzo, contralto, tenor, bass, baritone. What determines those? We have four basic categories we want to look at. We look at range, passaggio, tessitura, and timbre. And the most important of those two, as I said, are passaggio and tessitura. Because the passaggio is going to tell you where the the voice likes to switch from, as we call it colloquially, chest voice to head voice, and then tessitura, which is going to give you the best quality of tone and ease of production within a certain part of the vocal range. So the contralto voice is similar in its registration changes to a bass. And some of the common characteristics of the contralto voice is that it has a long chest register, oftentimes with an extension into the low range, and has a unique dark or some people describe it as a smoky color in the middle and chest register and that they use their chest register higher into their vocal range than other voice types. So when we talk about parts of the range, most contraltos, their range is going to be from the D an octave below middle C to the A above the treble clef. Some contraltos do have extensions below that D. I've seen singers or myself can sing as low as the G at the bottom of the bass clef. And some contraltos even have high Cs, like a soprano. The defining factor then is not range. Many well-trained singers have big ranges because once you learn proper singing technique, there is, yes, an ultimate limit to your range, but it's not the defining factor of what you're going to sing what is comfortable to sing and what area of your of your range sounds best is what's going to determine what voice type you are. We're going to talk about the passaggio or register change. Sopranos are going to want to switch out of chest voice into head voice around B3 or middle C. Mezzos like to switch 
around D slash E right above middle C. And contraltos want to make that transition at F to G above middle C. I want to talk next about the history of voice types because this really plays into our understanding of voice types and what has led to how many people are classified today. How voice types came to be or are, or how we decided to divide people into voice types. And it really started with the first formal invention of notation in Western music history. So in the 10th century, Gaudia e Rezzo invented staff notation as we know it today for Gregorian chant. And it first started off with just really two different types of staff, what is called um, an F clef, which we know is bass clef today, or a G clef, which is what we call our treble clef today. Now, there were two other clefs used in this time, and they both indicated where uh, middle C was, and that was for the alto clef and the tenor clef. Some of you have probably seen these. The alto clef is still widely used for the viola today. And if you've ever had to sing any early music, renaissance, madrigals, those sorts of things, sometimes you will have the music notated in this way. We also have to talk about how all of these voice types were voice types for men, as women were not permitted to speak or sing in church. And this is the really the birth of music, how it led to opera. In both Zacconi's 1592 treatise on, on music and singing and Caccini's in 1602 talk about how um, the falsetto voice was weak and not for solo singing, which is a part of the reason why we don't see women in a lot of early performance because it was assumed that all women were treble voices and using falsetto. And even in male singing, falsetto was not highly used at this time. So we had a division of voices into bass, tenor, alto, and soprano. Those were the four voice types. And contralto is interchangeable with alto. There's no difference in the two voice types. We have those four voice types to start off with. The mezzo-soprano voice type did not exist until around, the first time it's, it, it was published was 1775. A man named Quartz used it as a way to describe Faustina Bordoni's voice, and he also used it to describe a famous countertenor. His name is escaping me, but he was he was known as Sencio. So we didn't add that voice type, the mezzo-soprano voice type, until 1775. And the mezzo-soprano voice type was really a way to divide the soprano voice. Mezzo-soprano means medium soprano. It's a soprano that doesn't sing quite as high. Later on, we also added another category, which I've seen used um, to describe modern singers, but was really widely used in the mid-1800s to the early 1900s. And this is the mezzo-contralto voice. And the first singer to ever be described as a mezzo-contralto was Rosine Stoltz, who is the singer who first debuted the role of Leonora in La Favorita by Donizetti. This description, mezzo contralto, was also used to describe Maria Malabrand, who was the daughter of the famous tenor Manuel Garcia, and was also used to describe Pauline Viardot, also a daughter of Manuel Garcia, and a famous pedagogue in her own right and composer. So we've kind of lined out a basic history of voice types. Their origin coming from church music and how later the mezzo-soprano voice type was added and even the mezzo-contralto voice type was added. Now let's look at the history of female contraltos in opera. And I think you're going to be really surprised by how early the first female contralto singer was. We have this idea that when opera first came about, women were not allowed to perform. And the birth of opera is late 1500s, early um, 1600s. The very first opera that featured a female voice, a female contralto, comes from 1625 
La Liberazione di Ruggiero, and that was by Francesca Caccini, who was the daughter of famous Caccini that I mentioned earlier. And there were two female roles that were sung by contraltos. Now, I couldn't find any data on who these pos- the, who the particular singers that sang these roles were. But we, I did find data that, th- yes, this was a performed opera. And it has been revived. I think it had um, a performance in the 90s. And then I think 2005 was also done again at Boston Early Music Festival. And the very first instance where I could find information of a particular singer was in the first Penelope in Mont- Monteverdi's Ritorna di Ulisse in Patria in the Venice 1641 premiere. And her name was Giulia Paolelli, 1641, which I think is before we expect females to be involved in opera. I want to mention two other singers and that is Francesca Vaccini Boschi, and she was the first famous contralto, and she de- debuted in 1690 in an opera by Pola Rola and Lotti, and she sang Handel roles, and then one other singer, because I just, this is fascinating to me, Vittoria Tesi was the first famous black singer in opera, and she debuted in 1716 in Italy. So we've talked a little bit about the history of voice types and the history of the contralto voice in opera. I want to move on to myths and misconceptions about the contralto voice. And the first one is that contraltos are rare. I don't think contraltos are all that rare. I think that in today's society, they don't necessarily choose to go into opera. There's a great tool in Google and you can look at in in any publication, you can search and see a timeline for the use of a particular word. And I did this for the contralto voice type and I did it from 1700 to today. And we see this climb, 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 climb until about 1950. And then we start to see the term fall off. And I think this is important because around this time, soprano, there was this trend that using chess voice, they thought that using chess voice in singing was damaging. So we started to see a lot of teachers teaching women in particular to not use chess voice. So they started moving voices away from chest voice and therefore away from singing contralto. So like I said, I don't think that the contralto voice type is rare. I think that it is often misclassified. So we have contraltos in classical music in particular who are either being told to sing mezzo-soprano or even, the weird thing I didn't mention earlier is that the contralto voice type, as a contralto sings in the upper range, if it's untrained, will sound a little more flute-like and like a soprano voice. And with the invention of jazz music, I think a lot of contraltos chose to go into jazz music and popular music. We hear tons of pop singers who use, who sing with a contralto voice, Adele. She's a contralto. Most pop singers today don't sing particularly high, and you could classify them as contraltos or mezzos. Not that many pop singers are actual sopranos in today's world. The second myth I'd like to clear up is that there is a lack of repertoire, especially for young contraltos. Now, I compiled data of contralto roles. I looked at first editions, their premiere cast, and AGMA Schedule C. I looked through all of this data in order to find all the roles that are a regular part of the repertoire. So I didn't include much early music. I didn't include include Monteverdi and Vivaldi. And I found over 120 roles for contraltos. And of those, a third of them are leading roles. So the idea that there are no roles and especially any leading roles for contraltos is completely false. Most roles for contraltos, they fall into four categories, old, witches, whores, or men. And if we were to name a few of these roles, I'm going to start with some of the earliest. So in Daido and Aeneas, the sorceress is a role for the contralto. It is often played by mezzos or even tenors today. An opera that I, has had some renewed popularity, Agrippina, Otone, was first played by 
Francesca Vanini Boschi, who I mentioned was the first famous contralto. She also played the role of Junone in Agrippina. Another role that is a leading role for a contralto is Cornelia in Giulio Cesare. If we move ahead in time a bit, we come to Rossini, which we have Rosina in The Barber of Seville, and Isabella in Italiana in Algeri. For Verdi, we have Maddalena in Regoletto and Frederica in Louisa Miller. And of course, Ulrika in Malo in Maschera. I'll talk more about some other roles later. And I will also share this this spreadsheet that I've made on the Patreon page. And I'll continue to add more roles to this spreadsheet. I'll add the Vivaldi and um, the Monteverdi stuff and other early music. Newer stuff. With new operas, it's a little more challenging because like I said, the use of the contralto voice had a huge fall off after the 1950s. There are a few uh, modern operas that do call for a contralto. Adam's The Death of Klinghoffer. Um, Marilyn Klinghoffer is a contralto. And actually, Achnaten by by Philip Glass, um, Nefertiti, is also a contralto role. Although, like I said, um, a lot of these roles are cast as mezzos today. Next myth is that contraltos don't have high notes. I can really only think of maybe two or three three roles that I've sung that are contralto roles that I didn't have to sing above the treble clef. A lot of particularly dramatic contralto roles, you are asked to sing A flats and even B flats above the treble clef. If a voice or a singer has proper vocal technique, they have high notes. Whether or not they're asked to sing those notes by composers is a totally different thing. If we think about some of the famous contralto roles, Ulrika, you have to sing an A-flat in the aria. Lucretia, you have to sing an A in the aria. Any opera that has a contralto and has a period where is experiencing high emotion, they're often asked to sing high notes. Dalila is another role which, although was actually written for a mezzo, in particular, uh, Sasson actually wanted Pauline Viardot to sing the role. And like I mentioned earlier, Viardot was a mezzo-soprano, but was described as a mezzo-contralto. She had a very rich lower tessitura. And he actually wanted her to be the first Dalai Law, but she turned him down because she was older and she feel that it would be the right fit. And if we think of the role of Dalai Law now, it is often cast as a contralto or with a mezzo who has a very, very rich lower range to their voice. And Dalai Law is also asked to sing a B-flat in uh, Amor Viaze De. The fourth and final myth that contraltos are a subcategory of mezzo-sopranos. Now, my biggest issue with this is that the mezzo-soprano voice type did not exist until after we were already defining female voices as contralto. The mezzo-soprano voice type did not exist until the mid-1700s. Like I said, in 1775, we had the first published mention of the mezzo-soprano voice type. Also, mezzo-sopranos, in their definition, are a type of soprano, not a type of contralto, a type of soprano. There may be similarities between the two voice types, but they are inherently different. Now, a couple things throughout history that have led to these myths. The Metropolitan Opera has an archive of every singer that has ever sung on their stage, and they categorize all contraltos as mezzos, which I think has also further perpetuated this idea that contraltos are a type of mezzo, which I'm firmly against. One of them is the inflation of what we know as Concert A. Today, Concert A is defined as 440 hertz, and it was standardized in 1953. Before this, A was defined at different points throughout history at different pitches. In the Baroque period, many tuning forks were were around 415 hertz, and this is the standard that we use today when we perform Baroque music. Classical music was around 420 hertz. So if we think of Mozart 
or Haydn or early Beethoven, the first time that A was defined by law was in France in 1859. They signed into law that A was defined at 435 hertz. Another interesting tuning system to mention is that Verdi, the famous Italian composer, had his own tuning. He used A at 432 hertz, so slightly below the French standard. And there are a couple different tuning systems. What we use today is called equal temperament, and that really means that we are using equal space between pitches. And this really came about because of the piano. Before this, a couple different systems were used. Just temperament was used or Pythagorean tuning was used, which is closest to the, the system that Verdi is using with the 432. And that makes it more logarithmic, I believe. So if we have an inflation of pitch over time and quite a big inflation from 415 hertz to 440 hertz is a half step. And in some places, the pitch is continuing to rise. In Vienna, regularly they use either 442 or 445 is A. La Scala has a few recorded histories of tuning forks being around 450 or 452 in the 1800s. There was just a lot of inconsistency until, like I said, in 1953, it was internationally agreed upon that we would use 440 hertz as A. So with this inflation of pitch, we see that roles normally played by contraltos become a bit more difficult because if we're raising the pitch by a half step, that has a huge change on how a singer navigates the roles and the transitions in the voice. So if we take roles like Rosina and Isabella, which are from the early 1800s, these were roles that Rossini defined as contralto roles. And, and by defined, I mean that who he wrote the role for, because a lot of times roles were created for particular singers. And every singer, even within the same voice type, will have a different voice and it will act differently. Those two roles were created for contraltos. One was Rosina and Cenerentola were for Gertrude Righetti and Isabella was for Marietta Marcolini. And now those two roles or those three roles are often sung by mezzos and Rosina is often sung by sopranos. It is rare that you hear contralto sing either of these roles, and I honestly think it has to do with the inflation of pitch. If these roles were set at 420 or even 435, they feel vastly different than at 440 or even further inflated. Luckily, with Baroque music, we have this standard of singing them at 415, which would feel very comfortable for more, most roles. Like I said, Cornelia, Ronaldo by Handel, and Semele Juno is originally a contralto role. Um, thinking about some Donizetti, we have Orsini in Lucrezia Borgia, or uh, Marquis de Birkenfeld in um, Le Fille du Regiment. That's another really famous contralto role that is often played by mezzos now. Another thing that's led to many singers away from being contraltos is that there is a lack of knowledge or training in how to identify and train contralto voices. When I began my training as a singer, as a young singer in high school, I always sang alto two in choirs. And when I began my interest in classical music, I was told that I'm a mezzo. And I trained as a mezzo for nearly five years before I ran into a teacher who specialized in researching voice types, really had an understanding of different voice types. And I also had the opportunity to work with a contralto, uh, Cindy Sadler. I was a part of her training program called Spotlight on Opera. And more recently, I worked with the great David Jones, who I think is the world's foremost expert on the contralto voice type. I feel very lucky to have encountered all these people throughout my training that helped me make the transition or really solidify my technique and how it differs for contraltos versus mezzos or sopranos. A bone I have to pick about a, a 
a trend that we have today in singing is high, light, and bright. My major bone to pick about this is that it often leads singers to constrict their throat instead of maintaining an open throat. And this has, I think, the most negative effect on low-voiced singers who have more naturally dark voices. Now, this is not to say that having this balance of chiaroscuro, light and dark, is not important. It is important in every voice. It feels like, though, in the last 50 years, the pendulum has really swung so far to light and bright that we have created a hierarchy within voice types, and many singers don't want to be categorized as contraltos or basses because they're afraid that they won't get any work by doing so. And furthermore, it's perpetuated by these myths that there is a lack of repertoire for these voice types or that they don't have high notes or that they're a subcategory of another voice type. We should be celebrating each voice type for its unique characteristics and the beauty that it brings to our art form. So I think I've cleared up all of the myths and misconceptions. If you have any more, please feel free to comment. <laughs> Going back to talking about contralto roles, I mentioned there are quite a few for Handel. Handel was very kind to the contra contralto singer. Other roles that contra contraltos can sing are oftentimes countertenor roles that were f for castrati, and particularly alto castrati, because castrati were broken into two major categories of alto castrati and soprano castrati before castrati were outlawed. And then it became countertenors, men singing in a reinforced falsetto. So a few other handle roles for contraltos, Ronaldo, Edwige in Rodalinda, Bertardio in Orlando, Bradamante in Alcina. This is a great coloratura um, contralto role. And I suggest listening to a new contralto, Avery Amaru. She's fantastic in this role. Also, Ton Credi by Rossini. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Leonora in Donizetti's La Favorita was written for Rosina Stoltz, who was the first female to be described as a mezzo contralto. So I really feel if you're a contralto ha who has a good upper extension, this is a role that you'll be able to sing quite well. This was one of the first arias that helped me kind of transition into contralto repertoire. For Wagner, we have a couple roles in the ring cycle that are for contraltos. We have the first Norn, Schwerleite, and of course, Erde. If we go a little closer to what we consider modern repertoire, Clemenestra and, El and Electra, who was first sung by the very famous Ernestine schumann Heink, La Zia Principessa and Suor Angelica by Buccini, and also Zita, uh, the character contralto part in Gianni Schicchi. We have Lucretia in The Rape of Lucretia by Britain, The Mother in Minotti's The Council, Madame Flora in The Medium, also by Minotti, Ma Moss in Copeland's The Tenderland, and the most recent role, which I think would fit a contralto voice really well, it, it was sung by the mezzo Stephanie Blythe in its premiere, is um, Gertrude Stein in Ricky Ian Gordon's 27. I really think that Stephanie Blythe has a voice that could easily sing any contralto repertoire well. She has a very extensive lower range. So as we're talking about these contralto roles, we do, contraltos often do play old women, witches, um, and men as we've seen. And most of the time, it's not boys as with mezzo-sopranos who are often playing boys, but like teenage boys to young men. Uh, contraltos often play men, and this has to do with, I think, the characteristic that their voice is deeper and um, more manly. I also want to mention um, mezzo, other mezzo roles that are very suitable for the contralto voice type. As I mentioned, Dalila, Carmen sits rather low, has a few high notes here and there, but is extremely comfortable to sing for most contraltos. 
Azucena in Verdi's Il Trovatore is a really interesting uh, history, I think, to it. The opera was actually first intended to be about Azucena and was supposed to be a soprano. And then he met the soprano who ended up seeing Leonora in Il Torovatore and really changed the story quite a bit. But in t- today's trends is that Azucena is often sung by a lower mezzo or even a contralto. They really want that dark, rich, smoky color in the voice. Omneris is another another role that I think many contraltos um, who have a little bit of a higher extension can comfortably st- sing. Valtraut and, and Fricka in the ring cycle both sit lower, could easily be handled by them. The Witch in Hansel and Gretel, Yezi Baba in uh, Rosolka, The Old Lady in Candide was first sung by a contralto, Joe in Little Women has a lower tessitura, The Third Lady in Mozart's Die Zauberflöte is often cast as a low mezzo or contralto, Marcellina is a, another role by Mozart for mezzos that could easily be sung by a contralto, and two final ones, Fenena in Nabucco by Verdi and Daido in Berlioz's Les Troyens. Okay, we're coming to the end. I want to talk about noteworthy contraltos past and present, and I'm going to break them down into four categories. We're going to talk about coloratura, or I'm going to mention coloratura contraltos, lyric contraltos, dramatic contraltos, and deep contraltos. So those are the contraltos with very low voices. Coloratura contraltos of the past, Vittoria Tesi, the first famous black contralto, was very, very famous during her time for her portrayal of many Vivaldi and Handel roles. Clara Butte, um, a famous English contralto, she uh, didn't sing many opera roles. She um, sang Orfeo and Gluck's Orfeo and Euridice. She mostly did concert work. For lyric contraltos, Kathleen Ferrier, who was the first uh, Lucretia in The Rape of Lucretia for Britain, and Rosine Stoltz, who I've mentioned several times, was the first um, Leonora in La Favorite. For dramatic contraltos, we have Marian Anderson, who was the first black singer to sing at the Metropolitan Opera. Um, she sang Ulrika in the Un Balo in Mascara. We have Sigrid Odniegen and Louise Homer. Then for deep contraltos, Maureen Forrester and Ernest schumann Heink. Okay, for present day contraltos, coloratura contraltos, we have the great Marilyn Horn, who, although she's not singing today, she still is very involved with training singers. I would really consider her a mezzo contralto. She sang many, many roles that are considered contralto roles. She also sang many mezzo roles. Avery Amaru, she's a, a wonderful, young, up and coming contralto. Her voice moves extremely well, and I really look forward to seeing where she goes. For lyric contraltos, more on the fuller side of lyric, we have the Canadian contralto Marie-Nicole Lemieux and Sonia Prina. For dramatic contraltos, we have Meredith Ardwati, Gwendolyn Brown, Cindy Sadler, and I've I've included Stephanie Blythe in this list because she has also sung many, many contralto roles throughout her career. And if I were to categorize her voice, I would I would categorize her as a mezzo contralto. And finally, deep contraltos. We have Eva Podlis, the very famous Polish con- contralto, and Natalie Stutzmann, who has a wonderful, wonderful voice. She does a lot of early Baroque music, and she's also a conductor of her own ensemble. To wrap up this episode, my soapbox episode, I'd like to talk about reclaiming our voice type, the contralto voice type. In the last five years, there has been a renewed interest in the contralto voice type, and I've seen a lot more young singers 
seniors categorize themselves as contraltos. There is a website called the Contralto Corner. If you are someone who is interested in learning about contraltos who are working now, or if you're a casting director and you'd like to help support contraltos, you can go there and look through the profiles and take a listen. I also would like to challenge any voice teachers out there to really educate yourselves about training the contralto voice. You can go to David Jones's website, thevoiceteacher.com, and he has a great articles about the contralto voice and, you know, learning how to identify them and how to train them because training them is a little different than training a mezzo. Contraltos really have to concentrate on a couple things. Not over singing in the middle register, it's really easy to do so, but often leads to a little too much tension as you get into the passaggio and it makes it really hard to get through that shift. Maintaining an open throat through the passaggio, which I think is an issue with everyone, but as many contraltos are, are misunderstood, they've been asked to sing high, light, and bright. The easiest way for them to do that is often to constrict the throat instead of allowing it to stay relaxed and open. And then false color and tongue tension is also an issue. Please head over to that website and have some reading if, again, if you are a voice teacher or um, a contralto or a mezzo who thinks they might be a contralto and wants to educate themselves further. The final part of reclaiming our voice type is not being afraid of all of these ideas that contraltos don't have high notes or contraltos don't have any roles to sing. I hope that this episode has cleared up any of those misconceptions and myths and that those of us out there that are contraltos Feel free to use the voice that we were born with. Thanks for listening to this podcast episode. We hope you enjoyed it. We'd love to hear your thoughts and requests, so leave us a comment below. For more information about the podcast or for extras, check out our Patreon page, www.patreon.com slash opera unbound. You can help support the creation of this and much more content for as little as $3 a month. Like and subscribe to our channel and also follow us on Instagram at Opera Unbound to stay updated. Ciao!